Example 12.4 says let f be a mapping given by f of x equals 3x squared plus 2x minus 2. We have a domain of all real numbers and the first thing we're asked to do is to graph. So we've been seeing some examples of this 12.3 uh, and 12.2 and really the, the best way for us to do that is to look at the vertex form. And if you look at example 12.1d this is the exact function that we worked with in that example and we already found the uh, vertex form. So let me go ahead and write that result down carrying that over from 12.1d let's try that again f of x was equal to 3 times x plus 1 third squared minus 7 thirds. So what we can get from that is three things. Number one, the vertex is equal to negative one-third comma negative seven-thirds. Number two is that this is going to be a parabola that opens up. And number three, there is going to be a vertical stretch by three. So I'm going to start with the vertex and I'm going to go negative one-third to negative seven-thirds. So that's going to be a little bit to the left of the y-axis and then uh, a little bit below negative two. So think about negative seven-thirds as the mixed number negative two and one-third. That will help you to see where it's located. Um, so this is going to give us the uh, the location of the vertex. Now, normally, if I was graphing, I would say, uh, let's go over one, and then we would go up one, and that would be the location of um, my next point. But since we have a vertical stretch by three, when I go over one, I actually have to triple whatever that value is. So instead of going up one, I would have to go up uh, one, two, three, and I would have a point located right there. And so this gives me uh, a very stretched out version of the parabola. And so I'd, I'd kind of do a mirror image of that going this way. And this gives me a, a rough estimate for what this picture is supposed to look like. Now we talked about at the end of example 12.3, that sometimes it's it's beneficial to do the analysis first and then let the analysis drive the graph rather than the graph drive the analysis. This would be one of those examples where I think that the analysis could be more beneficial uh, to do algebraically rather than trying to get the information directly from the graph. Simply because the, um, I, for starters, look at the place where it crosses the x-axis somewhere in between zero and one, but I have no idea exactly where it is. It could be exactly 0.5, it could be 0.6, it could be 0.57, I, I don't know. It could be somewhere in between. Um, so that's what makes it difficult to, to use the graph to be able to come up with things. And, and say the y-intercept as well. Right? Does that y-intercept happen exactly at negative two? Or does it happen at negative 2.1? or negative 1.9. It's kind of hard to say. So let's start looking at the analysis portion and let's see if we can use that to help us get a better understanding of the graph. So part B says the uh, domain and range. So for the domain of this function, I would say all real numbers, because that was given. Um, for the range, since we did start to, to get a, a picture here, we know that it opens up and it starts at the vertex uh, negative one-third, negative seven-thirds, then we can write the range as starting at negative seven-thirds and going to infinity. So that's all done. Um, part C, which is the stating of the intercepts, 
is where we're going to start to see our first little bit of, uh, of trouble because we know that we can't find those exactly uh, by looking just at the graph. So we're going to have to go through the analytical steps to do that. So let's review the analytical steps for finding an intercept. There's two intercepts. There's the x-intercept and the y-intercept. For the y-intercept, you will always let x be equal to zero. Doesn't matter what kind of function I give you, quadratic, linear, something else, doesn't matter. You can always find the y-intercept by letting x be equal to zero. In which case, I would take my uh, standard form equation and I would substitute in zero for the x. In other words, I'd calculate f of zero. So that would be three times zero squared plus two times zero minus two, which is gonna end up simplifying and just being f of zero equals negative two. So that tells me that I have a y-intercept located at zero, negative two. So as it turns out, looking at our graph, let me erase some of this, these red lines here, it does end up giving us a point exactly at zero, negative two. So we know that there's an axis of symmetry that runs through the vertex. So there should be another point just like this here um, to the left of the axis of symmetry. It's gonna be the mirror image of that y-intercept. Now obviously it's not a y-intercept because it's on the left side of that axis of symmetry, but it at least gives us a better indication of what's going on there with the, uh, the left side of the parabola. So we get a nice uh, beginning of that curvature there. So the next calculation is the, uh, the x-intercept. The x-intercept is definitely gonna be uh, a little bit more involved but again, it's the same procedure um, every time you wanna find an x-intercept. You are supposed to let uh, f of x be equal to zero. Now, in the event that you're not um, using function notation, then equivalently, you could just say, let y be equal to zero. It's the same thing. f of x is meant to represent uh, y values. So uh, either one of those will get you to the point where you would say uh, zero equals three x squared plus two x minus two. Now I have to admit, um, using the standard form and setting it equal to zero like this is not gonna be the way that I wanna do it. We have two different versions of the same equation. We have the standard form and we have the vertex form, and they are 100% equivalent. They're exactly the same. They just look different, but they, are, but they are describing the exact same function. So I can just as easily say zero equals three times x plus one-third squared minus seven-thirds. And that would be just like letting f of x equal zero, but I'm doing it for the vertex form. So this is a lot easier to work with, and here's the reason why. When we solve an equation like this, we're trying to get to the point where we will eventually say x equals something. If you look at the standard form, x shows up twice, which means we have to somehow get those two x's together to be just a single x for us to be able to get to the final solving process. But if you look at the vertex form, there's already only just one x in your vertex form. So you have quite a bit less work to have to do in order to be able to solve this thing for x. So with that said, that gives us the hopefully the proper motivation for why I prefer to use the vertex form over the um, standard form, so let me bring back in that 7 third. So let's go through the process of solving. You're gonna first add 7 thirds to both sides. So you'll get 7 thirds is equal to three times x plus one third squared. Then you will need to divide 
both sides by 3, resulting in 7 ninths is equal to x plus 1 third squared. Then we will need to take the square root of both sides. So when we take the square root of both sides, it's uh, pretty typical to go ahead and write in the square root there. And on the left hand side, we would have the square root of 7 over the square root of 9. And then on the right hand side, the square root and the square effectively cancel each other out, leaving us with x plus one third. But we can't just take the square root of both sides for free. There is a important consequence of that, and that is that we have to include a plus or minus uh, with the uh, square root that's still there. So now, as I look at this, I would say uh, square root of seven is just gonna stay as it is. Square root of nine is three. And so we have plus or minus the square root of seven over three. But my goal is to get the x by itself. I want it to just say equals x. So then I can subtract one third from both sides as well. And I can say negative one third plus or minus the square root of seven over three is equal to x. So what this is claiming is that there is two ordered pair for the x-intercepts. One of the x-intercepts is located at negative one plus the square root of seven over three comma zero. And the other x-intercept is located at negative one minus the square root of seven over three comma zero. These are the exact locations, exact. No approximation whatsoever. But for graphing purposes, uh, the approximation is going to be really, uh, really important for us to have. So for the approximation, you'll want to get out a calculator and you'll want to type these expressions in so that way we can figure out about where they're located on the graph. I've already done these calculations. If we look at the uh, addition first, negative one plus the square root of seven divided by three, uh, that is going to be approximately uh, zero point five five and if we do the subtraction next negative one minus the square root of seven divided by three that is approximately negative one point two two so going back over here to the graph we can have well about zero point five five um, we already have that one marked here in between zero and one and then negative 1.22, go ahead and mark that one, It'd be about right here. And then that gives me a way to go ahead and finish up the left side of this parabola. And it gives me a much, uh, much more accurate picture of what's going on here with the graph. So that's gonna be uh, our graph of F. So that takes care of part C. I know there's a lot involved in that one. Uh, and that was because the x-intercepts uh, did not land exactly on a nice integer value and we had to do that calculation we just didn't know exactly where it was then uh, let's move on to part D uh, part D is going to ask us to look at the uh, relative extrema there's one relative extrema in this case it is a relative minimum so we'll state relative minimum and that is located at the vertex which is negative one-third comma negative seven thirds and the relative maximum uh, doesn't exist there is none for part e we're looking at the increasing decreasing behavior um, to the left of the vertex we are decreasing so we're decreasing from negative infinity to negative one third and we are increasing to the right of the vertex so that'll be from negative one third to infinity and then finally for part F, write an equation for the axis of symmetry. The axis of symmetry will be located at x equals negative one third.